Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests today are artistic director, conductor, Rachel Warby, and world-famous musician, Ara Dabanjian. Rachel Warby was born in Nyack, New York, where at the age of five, she studied piano. She took a lot of lessons <laughs> all the rest of her life. She's been honored with many awards, including doctorates from various universities, and she received the Presidential Medal of Honor for Lifetime Achievement. In 1994, she served four years on the National Council of the Arts, which was a presidential appointment. And Rachel has guest conducted all over the world, China with Jesse Norman, uh, with whom she continues to collaborate. I could go on and on about all the countries you've been to, but let's talk about this work first with Miss Norman. How did that happen? Well, it, it came about in a very interesting way, actually. I uh, had heard about her through a mutual friend, and she had heard about me. And I got it in my head that I would invite her to Pasadena to help us uh, do a fundraiser for the orchestra. And I discussed all of the possible fundraising ideas with the members of my board. And they were all very fancy schmancy black tie events where she would sing for a select audience. And there would be very high ticket prices. And finally came the day of our appointed telephone conversation. She was in Paris doing, um, working with Pierre Boulez. And I was in Pasadena <laughs> in my office. And you know, I, my cell phone rang and I picked it up. Hello, <laughs> this is Jesse Norman. <laughs> you know, the, your Hello. first instinct is, <laughs> no, it isn't. Right. But I, you know, I entered, I said, how wonderful to hear from you, Miss Norman. And she said, tell me what you have in mind. And I was just about to go through my short list of possible black tie fundraisers. And suddenly I started to think of the students with whom I had worked over the past five years in Pasadena Unified School District, uh -huh. whose um, lives were not privileged, and especially oh. of the students I had worked with at Blair High School, um, right. for whom an encounter of any sort with Jesse Norman would change their worlds. And I found myself speaking to her on the phone and asking her if she would come make her debut in a high school gymnasium. <gasps> Is that right? Because you continue to do that outreach work in yes. South Central yes. and around yes, the, the underprivileged in yes. Pasadena. Yes. So that's how you did it? Our first encounter was actually a program that explored the life of Martin Luther King Jr. She must and have her loved life. You. And, the, and I surprised her with the gospel choir singing, He's Got the Whole World oh, in His Hands. Oh, great. And uh, she said to me afterwards, um, we're from the same moment and we should continue to make music together. What are you doing in October? Oh, and that was China? <laughs> yes. And then you went on to Morocco and we've then... We've been to Morocco, we've been Spain. to Spain, we've been to Macedonia, uh, we're going to Korea, Israel, Australia. So you conduct for her? I'm her music director, yes, and conductor. And so she must love you to take you to all these places. Well, um, she does call me Angel, and I do call her Miss Norman. <laughs> How fabulous. And, and then, so, so here you're conducting all over the world. How did this career start? My career really started uh, when I was a child and became um, a worshiper of Leonard Bernstein. Oh, not because you were playing the piano. <laughs> well, he played the piano as well. Oh, he did. Uh. And he was, you know, politically conscious and socially aware, and I came from a politically conscious, socially aware family, and he liked to mix up different genres of music, and I was raised listening to Odetta and Miriam McKeebia and Thelonious Monk and Glenn Gould, and, you know, composers like Ellington and composers like Beethoven. So I felt um, a kinship with him immediately. But that doesn't tell us everything, because we all love that kind of stuff, but we couldn't conduct. We couldn't be an artistic director. We don't have that musical talent. So that's what it is. 
Well, <laughs> that kind of mystery about what runs in the veins of people who, really? you know, end up being conductors, I, I think I'd rather leave as a mystery because I think for all of us, mm. it's something different. You were an assistant conductor at Carnegie Hall with the youth, so mm -hmm. did that well, really I actually, start you on your youth programs or, or looking well, into the young people? I had been the assistant conductor here in Los Angeles um, during Ernest Fleischmann's tenure as oh, executive at, director. At the Philharmonic? At the Philharmonic. And at this period of the life of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, it was Mr. Fleischmann's vision that there would be a tremendous amount of outreach. Mm -hmm. And with me in mind as the uh, musical director slash curator of these events, he really created oh. lots and lots of concerts that the Los Angeles Philharmonic and I very proudly presented to uh, children and people young and old uh, at no charge throughout the community. From that position, I got the position at Carnegie Hall, which was oh. to, which was actually Bernstein's old job. It I was after Philharmonic. After the Philharmonic. I see. I, see. Yeah. I thought it was the they other way around. Stole me away. Oh, that was interesting. Yeah. But the thing is, the Philharmonic must have been through the 80s. Early, Late, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I yeah. was on the California Arts Council at the time, and one of the directives was for the Philharmonic, because they were one of our highest uh, grossing companies in, mm -hmm. in our state, for them to do outreach. And so there you there were the person I was. doing I that. Was the person indeed. And you know, and in they my, still do it, don't they? They still, a tremendous amount. And in my position as music director, of the Pasadena Pops within the context of the orchestras of Pasadena, I can have continued to do a tremendous amount of outreach. And this concert that we're doing January 12th is called, what is it? Classical. Classical, classical. with this a ZZ. Is, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a marriage of jazz and classical. So from the jazz world, we have Sherry Williams. And from the classical world, of course, Angel Blue. And I'll be the curator. It's these two singers talking about their lives, singing, sharing music back and forth and me in being the interlocutor and trying to get them to talk to one another and to the audience about their lives, about the difference of the genres, how they approach singing. Do you do, um, are you the conductor or are you the I'm not the facilitator. Just the facilitator. I'm the conductor when the Pasadena Pops takes the stage uh, in March, and again, of course, over the course oh. of the summer at Descanso Garden. So tell us a little bit about the Pasadena Pops. What Pasadena, is it? It's, it's, um, we're an, an orchestra of fantastic musicians that um, plays concerts which have not, which explore every genre of music. They're very much born out of my belief that all great oh. music is great music. Oh, so it is part of what you do. All the background oh, yes. music that you talked about, they play. Oh, they don't yes. play just classical. No, we play Ellington, we play Gershwin, oh, we I play see. Franz Waxman film scores, we play John Williams film scores, we play Bernstein, Beethoven, Mahler, Aaron J. Kernis, we play Armenian music, we play Spanish music, we play Chinese music. Oh. We play music um, of the broadest swath as long as it's great music. How large is the orchestra? The orchestra <laughs> ranges from about 65 people to about 80 people. Oh, it does. During the summer, we play at Descanso Gardens, which is like an intimate Hollywood bowl. We play to Oh, so two it's outside. Outdoors, we play to 2,000 people a night. Really? And we play each concert three times, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. Oh, that's fabulous. And you yeah. conduct those. Yes. Yes. So that's my real job. That's your real job. <laughs> my real job is that I'm a conductor. But you had a different real job as a law, as a conductor in Wheeling, West Virginia. Yes. How did you get there? You know, it was my first job as music director, which means that you're the 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 single person um, who makes the the decisions about the mission and vision of the orchestra oh, as opposed to just being a conductor, a staff conductor. But do and you do both? Yes. As an artistic director? Yes. I see. They, they offered me the position after a series of auditions and I really? took the job. But in Wheeling, West Virginia? Fantastic orchestra. You know, Wheeling is, is, is to Pittsburgh like Pasadena is to Los Angeles. It's really oh, exactly. a suburb of Pittsburgh oh. and of Cleveland. And where do they play? The Wheeling Symphony plays in the Capitol Music Hall at, in Wheeling, which seats about 2,300 people, and all around the state of West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Ohio. Oh, so, but you were lauded for that. They gave you this big award and made you the laureate. Yes. 
<laughs> I am the conductor laureate of the Wheeling West Virginia Symphony. And then the other thing is Romania. Yes, I started an American music festival in Romania. I was invited there for the first time to conduct the Mozart Requiem. And at the conclusion of the it's performance, amazing. I said to myself, you know what the people of Romania need is not another Requiem. They need some like swing, they need Gershwin, they need Bop, they need Bernstein, they need syncopation and happy, upbeat, Cole Porter kind of music. So I proposed to begin an American music festival there and they embraced the notion immediately. Then where do you get the musicians? From there? It is it is the uh, Transylvania Philharmonic of Cluj, Romania. That is that plays, right? Yes. And do you conduct it or do they do? I conduct. And, and then do... Do they play all the music that they you? I bring the music with me, <laughs> physically <laughs> carry the music there. Yeah, is that right? And we rehearse for a couple of weeks and then we perform several different concerts. And uh, how hard a job do you have? You know, <laughs> my, my life is my work, so I never think of it as being on the hard or easy spectrum. It's what I do in order to breathe. It, you have to breathe it, but how do you, how do you read all that music? How do you know when to tell the violins to come in? How do you know all that? When you stand up there and you have your baton, right? You use a bat baton? I do. What, what goes through your mind and how do you do it? Well, there are <laughs> infinite number of things that go through your mind and, you know, the way you do it is actually by studying for hundreds and hundreds of hours prior to that moment so okay. that the concert is the true tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. You know, there's a tremendous amount of time that's spent in monk-like solitude where you're learning all these notes and you're learning all of these, about all of these instruments and how the sounds are going to work together vertically and horizontally. And so that's all private, very solitary work. That's and, what I wondered. And the moments on the stage where you see uh, George Mester or Asa Pekka Salonen or me are, are those are the public moments. Very small, aren't they? But uh, uh, in comparison to the moments which precede them that make that moment of the bow happen, that's uh, time out of time. And what about being a woman compo uh, conductor? There are very many. There are more now than yes. there were when I began my career, I'm very happy to say, but it, we're, we're still a small minority. Uh, growing, but a small minority. And I, I think, though, we're, we're very much in the field of conducting anyway, uh, reflecting how the rest of the country is moving in terms of where uh, the percentage of women in a ver variety of different fields. And I think when you have accomplished women who are dependable, who are out there, who are like you, that opens the field for the rest of uh, women to come in. Who are like you. No, like you. Oh, no, like Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Joan, for inviting me. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. And thanks for watching this part. We'll be right back with Ara Dumbanjian and his instruments. Hi, welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm Joan Quinn, and I'm here with Ara Debanjian, who was born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon. And by the time he was a teenager, his family came to the valley where he went to Reseda High and then Cal State Northridge. Ara is the music director of the award-winning band Element. You founded the band Element, Ara. Yeah. Why did you do that? Um, it was the, uh, I met a, a very interesting group of, uh, uh, how should I say, younger, <laughs> younger people. Yeah, I remember <laughs> uh, Younger band. musicians. Yeah. And uh, it was a very interesting thing uh, at the time, which was about three years ago, and uh, <laughs> decided that it would be, uh, would be a good thing to, uh, to make something of it. Did you put them together or they were already together? It kind of came together by accident, let's say and uh, uh, slowly but surely the, it multiplied and uh, uh, kind of changed directions. We were going to do one thing, but then we were going to go uh, 
through the regular rock scene and whatnot and immediately changed course and went with the world music scene, which is actually more dear to me and uh, very uh, uh, automatically, uh, let's say, intuitive. People uh, talk a lot about the world music scene. What does that really mean? What does it encompass? I keep hearing it all the time. Well, f the one thing it doesn't encompass is, is the, <laughs> the, the mainstream Oh, uh, it does. Radio. It's on the outside. Th yeah, it's, it's uh, usually you, you won't hear, obviously you won't hear that when you turn the FM dial unless you go uh, a little bit towards the left and to some, somewhere, you know, some of the uh, independent stations. I see. Let's say. Um, and uh, other than that, the, the world music scene is usually... Uh, uh, held by concerts and whatnot, uh, kind of, uh, again, like I said, it's not the mainstream thing. So is it different kind of ethnic groups? Music it by is. different it ethnic groups? It is. It's very groups. diverse, obviously, hence the, 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 world. the name World Music. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, there's a lot of uh, English or American music in that is as that well. Right? Sure, sure. We play, we play original songs that are, uh, that are written in English. Well, your yeah. element band. Yes. Do you play in it? Yes. Oh, you do play. Yes. What do you play? Uh, I usually I change instruments a lot. Uh, I mainly play the uh, uh, the nylon string guitar. However, I also uh, play the oud, the saz, the bazooki, uh, the accordion, the keyboard. So uh, I move around a lot. You play so many things. Did you go to music school? I didn't. How Actually. could you not go to music school <laughs> with this ability? I, uh, what would have I, happened to you if you went to music school? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> may, maybe I'd be too structured. Maybe, oh, that could be, right? And, yeah, I think I'm, I'm uh, more, more freelance this way. I can, I, I'm really free to do what I want to do this way. Uh, I can experiment this way. Not to say that if you did go to music school, you couldn't, but I never had the chance. I, I never did. And oh, maybe, didn't? maybe I didn't try hard enough either because I think um, reading music and, and uh, my younger self just didn't get along very well. So you I, don't? You don't read music? No. Is that right? Then no, I, <laughs> <laughs> this is so if, if I do a very little, very little. I, I mean, I, I know I can read notes, but I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say I can read music. Then how do you play with other people? Um, it's it's all by ear. It's all by ear. I'm sure I'm not the only person uh, that does this. There are many other people, but but it's very intuitive. It's uh, uh, it's hard to explain. It's I guess it's a gift. Um, people talk about like jamming with each other, musicians and all that. Is that what that kind of thing is? Not notes. Absolutely, you can find that in jazz music a lot. Um, a lot of jazz musicians are incredible with that. Um, and they don't read? They, uh, or they some don't do, some to, don't, yeah. but, but a lot of it is improvisation, which improvisation has, has, has no structure. Um, so when you started changing element, what did you change it to? Um, well, it, it really, the change that we're talking about started, it, it, it happened very quickly. We immediately recognized that, that what we were thinking uh, was not going to succeed. And, oh, right. and luckily, we, we changed that immediately and changed course, and we went with the world music. And, and we went with a lot of Armenian music, and we had the support of, of the community. But are they all Armenian players? No, we do have, we've had uh, several uh, non-Armenian uh, players in, in and out of the uh, uh, the band, but right now the nine-piece member band has one non-Armenian. <laughs> the thing is, you talk about folk fusion. Yes. You've described some of that work <coughs> as folk fusion. What is that? Uh, folk fusion. It's <coughs> it it is fusion, like it says. It's it's taking folk music and modernizing it. Ah. Um, what I've done with Element Band is uh, my goal <coughs> was to make it listenable by uh, people other than uh, Armenians, uh, introduced Armenian music and some of the other things. I mean, we play four or five different languages. Oh, so that could be on the world music stage. Exactly, I and see. and be be actually uh, uh, easy to listen to by uh, <coughs> by non-Armenians and by just regular uh, Americans. Then how do you take it? You take an Armenian folk song. Uh, let's or say music, yes, or yes. What for would example, you do? How would you do uh, an, an old. Let's say we take a folk song, an old traditional song. And where do you find that? Uh, well, a, a lot of it I grew up with. 
Oh, uh, so you but, knew, you right. heard the music? Yes, a lot of it I grew up with. And is it folk dancing or music? Not or? necessarily dancing. It's a lot of it is is folk music and uh, really uh, with with great lyrics. Storytelling. Storytelling lyrics, uh, love songs and whatnot. A lot of ballads that that I like to take <coughs> and modernize it and put. Uh, even some of the things that are not so traditional, put the flamenco guitar in there, uh -huh. the mandolin, the accordion, which is not uh, the norm with, with Armenian music. Do you change the words? Uh, no, 99% of the time, no. And do you have a singer? <laughs> yes, I have. actually I have three. Oh, I see. Oh, so it's have, a great song. Yeah, we, we started with only a, a female and a male singer, and they left. Now we have three other beautiful singers, a male singer and two female singers. And do they sing together? And, they do. Uh, they do. So you brought a, an instrument. Shall, I did. Can I hold it? Sure. Or no, sure, maybe sure, you sure, should. Sure. No, no, I want you to hold it. <laughs> the, this is called the saz. There's no hole in it. Uh, no, no. That's what's interesting about this instrument. Um, the saz is a... Uh, is a it, it comes from the Middle Eastern region, let's say, Near East or Middle East. S-A-Z. S-A-Z. And uh, the interesting thing about this is the uh, authentic sound, obviously. Oh, that has a different sound. Yes. It's three strings. It's uh, three different notes on oh, the strings, notes, yes. Yeah. It's actually a, a total of uh, uh, seven strings on here. So it's, it's... Uh, <laughs> oh, are there seven? Oh, there are yeah. two, two, and two. Yes. Oh, I see that. So... Oh. So do you play two strings together? Uh, you play three strings here uh -huh. and two strings there. Uh -huh. So... Oh, I see. And then... You usually you play it with a pick thing. right now. Actually, you're not supposed to act because I don't have a pick. I'm just picking it with my, uh, with my nails here. It doesn't need a hole? No. What does the hole do? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the it hole looks pretty weird, doesn't it? Well, the, the hole is where the sound is supposed to resonate. Yeah. And that's why it's uh, it's strange for a lot of uh, uh, a lot of Western musicians how how you know th th there's sound is not supposed to come out of this technically. Right. So that's according, what I'm asking. According you don't to think it can. yeah, but it does. And what about the back? Show us the back. Mm. Oh, it's big hump. Yes. What's it made out of? This is a huge... It's made out of mahogany. It's beautiful. Yes. And yes. does somebody make that for you, or where do you get it? No, that? actually, this this was uh, this was made by somebody in the Middle East, but it was more of a not not a specific. Uh, but you can apprentice. buy them only in the Middle East. Um, you, these days you can buy them online. Are they electric? Uh, they can be. They this, can be. This particular one isn't. You play an oud. Yes. Which is. It's kind of shaped like this, right? But it has Similar, a big however, hole. yes, it, it it has it now. The oud has holes. It has three holes. <laughs> oh, it has three holes. Yes, where the saws doesn't. The difference between uh, this and the oud, the oud has a much bigger belly. And how many strings? On the oud, there are eleven strings. Oh, so that's four. yes, but again, they're doubled up, except for the the lowest string, which is a single drawn oh, string. I never realized that. So there's two strings on it. Yes, or three it, strings together, similar uh -huh. to a mandolin. So, I've seen you on stage. I've seen you do the uh, Red Dog Howls. I've seen you do uh, Love's Labor Lost. I've seen you a lot where you sit on stage and you play. I don't know what instrument you play. Maybe you were playing this instrument. But, and you've written the music to go with the play. How, did, how do you do that? It, it's actually one of my favorite things to do because it's so spontaneous. Oh, and uh, a lot really? of times it is it is because it it does change it changes with the uh, actors uh, behaviors and mood that day and a lot of times you have to uh, create the music as you're going along although it's structured you know what you're playing uh, at, at different uh, spots in the play but it does tend to change every time but but doesn't that throw the actors off because they have specific lines to say. Right. Not necessarily because it, the actors are not following me. I'm actually following the actors. Oh, so they it's the know. other way around. It's, I see. it's according. Most everything stays the same. However, uh, like I said, according to their mood, sometimes you have to go with them. So it's very spontaneous. But it's wonderful seeing you on stage. And you also, I don't know, you can't read music, you can't write, but you did this documentary by Michael Hagopian, 
who's such a wonderful filmmaker, called River Ran Red. You did that? Yes. How'd you do that? <laughs> um, well, my, Michael is, is a great man to work with. He, uh, he is a legend, in my opinion, and the work he's done is amazing. Um, and the, the, again, the process that, that, that I use is, uh, is I record. I have my own recording studio, and uh, similar to the play, oh, I watch... I watch the movie, and according to what I was feeling, I interpreted that into music. And then does he hear it? And then you, yes. then you record it, and then yes. he, and then does he ha make any changes as a filmmaker? Of course, of course, he he has the final decision. Uh, and then you come in and redo it. Yes, yes. What do you like to do best? Do you like this? Uh, do you think your music will become mainstream, like Philip Glass and John Adams? I mean, they I, were not mainstream. Right. I I don't know if, if my music will. I I hope that this type of music does get out there. I think it is beautiful music. It's rich music. It's also honest and true music. It's not manipulated by by that. I mean, it's not manipulated electronically. Yeah, so I see. So it's that's real. why I I respect this kind of music, and I hope uh, more and more people uh, will, will uh, build respect towards it. Oh, thank you so much for coming on today. It's a pleasure. I loved having you, and keep riding to seven 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 South Figueroa on forty fourth floor, Los Angeles nine zero zero one seven, and shoot me an email, J A Quinn one at AOL.com. And before the music starts, I'm going to let Ara pick a little bit. <laughs> oh, he has well, a pick this, in his this pocket. This time we'll, we'll use a pick.